Bruce Haig and this is the Fiddle Channel. Today I'm going to talk about swing bowing. When you're playing jazz violin, the left hand is the one that gets all the attention, but in fact the right hand is the one that's doing most of the work. I'm going to give you a series of simple swing bowing patterns which will help to make your bow flow, and at the same time I'm going to give you some different ideas as to how the bow can help to make your solos more interesting. First, a very general point, and that's that mostly your bow should be very short. So instead of, uh, for a series of quavers, doing something like this, then something much more like this is much more appropriate. So bows of around an inch or two inches is more than enough for most of the things you're going to do. Um, certainly you do do long bows, but that's often slurred bows, and that's going to be including a lot of notes. Another general point is that when you're reading music, um, quavers will usually be written as even. So you might see a string of eight quavers. But in fact, in most jazz, those quavers are actually played long, short, long, short. If that were written down, it would look really cluttered. So it's, it's written straight, but we interpret that as swing. So instead of something like this, it's, it's actually played. Or instead of, it's played. Now, one obvious problem, if you're playing long and short with single bows, is that you're going to end up running out of bow because um, your down is going to be longer than your up. So we've got a series of bowing patterns which gets around that problem by giving you some extra up to get your bow back to where it started. So um, the most basic pattern is what's called chain bowing. doing is one single and then every other pair is slurred. So that easily gets around the problem of um, your bow moving towards the tip and it does that by um, by making by alternating between down longs and up longs. We can improve the chain bowing by um, by doubling the notes. So you basically play each note of a scale twice. Now I'll just point out that although this first part of this lesson is going to be mostly talking about scales, um, most of the patterns are equally appropriate to any old phrase, not just scales. So you might instead of, of playing um, be playing something like that, where you're not actually going all the way up, all the way down. So the pattern still holds. Now, uh, instead of chain bowing, uh, we've got one called, what I call the one and three. It's basically uh, one down and then three up. And then, similar idea is a five and three. So five separate and then three slurred. So I'm going to put on a, a little chord sequence and I'll demonstrate some of these patterns. swing bowing, and that is, as you're going up a scale, um, you're placing the emphasis on the 1, the 3, the 5 and the 7 of the chord, which is good because they're the strong notes. So for a G major scale, you've got the G, 
the B, the D, and the F sharp. So that's the, the 1, 3, 5 and 7, and they're the ones that you want to emphasise. And because it's swing, da, 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 we kind of, the, the second note is disappearing. So the 2, the 4 and the 6, which are the weak notes of the chord, are disappearing, which is good. Uh, but if you do more than one octave, let's see what happens. When you get to that A, into the second octave, suddenly you're now playing the, uh, the 2, because A is the 2 of a G chord. You're playing all the weak notes in the, where, they, where they should be the strong ones. So um, your second octave sounds very different from your first octave and it's no longer supporting the chords, it's fighting against the chords. It would be nice if you could go over the octave line and still be placing your strong notes where they should be. So um, this brings us to what's called the bebop scale, which is not necessarily anything to do with bebop. Um, but what it means is basically we're adding one extra note to the scale so that when you get above the octave then you're still in the right place. So what we're doing is, we're adding one extra note, which is uh, the flat seventh. So you've got two sevenths, a flat seven and a natural seven. And then, so notice that when we start the pattern again, we're on the G again. And then, so we've now got the, the strong notes back in the right place. So the bebop scale is a really useful pattern, there's nothing special about it, it doesn't sound very much different, it's just slightly more interesting, but as I say the advantage is it places your bow in the right place when you want it. You can also make your bowing of strings of quavers more interesting by using some syncopation, and something like, uh, like this. still a simple scale, you haven't done very much to it, but you've shifted the emphasis of some of the notes to add this syncopation and just make it more, more surprising and more interesting. Now in my book Exploring Jazz Violin, the, almost the first thing I talked about was uh, playing swing with separate bows and that was actually a mistake because playing swing with separate bows is quite hard. Um, one of the concepts I tried to get across is the idea of playing um, a string of quavers where you're playing long and short long and short but your bow is not actually moving up and the reason for that is it's kind of like a spring now if instead of using one of these patterns you decide you are going to use separate bows uh, your second and fourth and sixth note are not going to be so easy to deal with so um, we come up with the concept of uh, ghost bows, which are basically bows which are hardly there at all. So, um, so I'm playing it down, and then the up is, it's hardly a note at all. So, your brain is basically filling in the gap for what is almost not a note. So that's what's called a ghost bow. An interesting bowing pattern uh, is to use a, a string of up bows. Now to me that is a more interesting sound than Separate up and downs, they have something a bit mechanical about them, but when you're doing ups with all the action coming from your wrist, I think there's more um, precision to those notes. So that's an interesting thing to practice a string of, of uh, punctuated up bows. Stefan Grappelli had an interesting trick which he would do on, particularly on the melodies near, near the beginning of a tune. 
um, where there's a long note in the melody, he would break that note up into a string of little bows. So instead of something like this, you might do, or instead of, um, you might do, or instead of, um, you might do, or instead of, you might be. So whenever you see, um, when, you, when you're reading a melody, or playing a melody, which is basically not a very interesting melody because it's got a lot of long notes, then those long notes can easily be broken up. Um, there might be a long note at the end of a phrase, like... Uh, so, for two bars, there's nothing happening except that long G. But you can use that G uh, to break up into a series of interesting notes. So the bow's doing a lot of work and it's making basically that one single note into a lot of uh, little interesting notes. Now it's a good idea when you're soloing to take a look at your bow. Uh, I know this means uh, switching off a little bit of your brain from the, uh, from the job of playing, but just have a look at your bow and see what it's doing. Often when I'm uh, teaching someone and, they, and I look at their bow, what I see is this. Um, and I'll just give you a bit of chords. So I can explain it. So just watch what my bow is doing. So what's going on that I don't like is that basically the bow is in the same place all the time. It's in the middle. It's moving this more or less the same length and nothing interesting is happening in the bow. So what you've got to think about is your bow has a tip, it has a middle and it has a heel and you've got to try and use all of those uh, for different things. So the tip is good for smooth, soft and fairly subtle stuff. Uh, the heel is good for attacking. And the middle is somewhere in between. So I suppose the middle is the meat and potatoes, but the, the tip and the heel are where more interesting things happen. So just watch me do a little bit of solo now where I will try and use different parts of the bow. <laughs> So try and um, make the full use of the bow instead of just using parts of it. I did something there when I was playing at the tip and that's a, another what I think of as a Grappelli style and that's playing completely out of time in a really smooth way. So basically you're leaving those bar lines behind and you're playing completely smoothly. Um, only really placing the first note of a very long phrase and the last note in time and everything in between is completely loose. It's a great sound, it's, it's quite hard to do at first. Uh, I'll just demonstrate that again. too long but you get the idea uh, you've got to um, you've got to be able to completely free yourself from those bar lines but then the, the opposite is what I call the Frank Sinatra rhythm section which is uh, if, you, if you imagine a big horn section all playing uh, completely together um, with syncopation and lots of chops 
and you get this kind of feel. swing bowing patterns which will allow you to play nice and smoothly. I've given you some ideas about uh, separate bows, um, the importance of moving the wrist, the idea of lots of up bows, the idea of breaking up long bows, the idea of playing down at the heel with some lots of, uh, lots of choppy things and the idea of using the tip for very smooth flowing things. Uh, Bring all these together and it'll make your soloing a lot more interesting. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you subscribe and send me an email, I can send you um, a PDF with all of these bowing patterns written down. See you soon.